So let's get started. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is James Johnson, and I'm going to be your educator slash entertainer for the night. So let's get started here really quick. Basically, what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to talk about the Retirement Income Roadmap. And um, feel free to ask questions along the way or put a question in the chat. If you've got any questions, throw them out there. I'll be more than happy to help them. If you don't understand something, let me know. I'll go back and repeat it, whatever the case may be. So if we're going out here, uh, basically, here's your disclosures. I'm a licensed professional, but I'm not here to teach you about taxes or anything like that. However, I will talk a lot about taxes. Do you guys know you call a person with a little bit of information? The answer is dangerous. And you will all be dangerous when you leave here tonight. So don't run out and start doing stuff until you actually have a solid plan. And you'll have the opportunity to set up a no cost, no obligation, no sales appointment to actually sit down and get one of those if you'd like at the end of this. So I'm going to show you the five steps in retirement planning and I'm going to show you how to create guaranteed income you can't outlive, minimize taxes and build lasting wealth over this and what are the five steps it takes to do all that stuff. I've been doing this since about, oh, I don't know, 2003, something like that. I'm called top of the table for MDRT. I'm a long-term care specialist, a master lead advisor for Ed Slight for more than nine years. Um, Ex-Marine, president of Irvine Rotary, father of two, and many, many other things that I'd rather not talk about here. So, why am I passionate about retirement and income planning? Well, it's very simple because I believe that you should live like you're going to die tomorrow and plan like you're going to live forever because you just might. And the fact of the matter is, is we're living longer and longer today. And so if you don't plan for that, you could have a problem. And you got to be really, really careful because for most people, what's happening is you're playing a game. And you're over here in this first part of the game, and what you're doing is you're trying to accumulate enough money so that when you arrive in my world, which is distribution and preservation, you don't run out of money. And let me assure you that that game is played very, very differently. And if you knew what I know about retirement and estate planning, you would play the first half of the game very differently than you're probably playing it currently today. So what's going to happen when it comes to retirement is you're going to face several major risks in retirement. They're going to be inflation, and they're going to be long-term care, and national debt, and taxes, and withdrawal rates, and government, and longevity, and stock market, and sequence of return, and that most famous one of all, shit happens. Because it always happens. Every time you turn around, every time you think life is going great, something's going to come along and, you know, poop on your parade, so to speak. So we want to make some planning along the way. The ones that we're going to focus on tonight is we're going to focus on the stock market, longevity, taxes, and inflation. So your number one risk is going to be inflation. And whether you know it or not, it's something that's going to happen pretty much all the time. It is possible for there to be deflation, but for the most part, we're in an inflationary world, and we certainly have been for several years now. Now, if you look at the consumer price index in January of 2023, it's 6.4%. Now, what does that mean? Well, the consumer price index, what that means is that's the number that the government uses to inflate pensions, Social Security, etc. And last year, they used a number of 8.7%. We got some of the highest raises in Social Security in the last two years that we've gotten throughout history. There have been a couple other times in history where we got some that high. But for the most part, we don't get raises that high. Now, the interesting thing about the Consumer Price Index is it lacks three key categories of what we spend our money on. Health, food, and energy. Now, I don't know what you guys spend your money on, but a lot of it's health, food, and energy. So when they're actually reporting what inflation is, yeah, they don't always report this, the right number. Let's face it, the government's broke, and so if the government did report the right number, they would have a very hard time keeping up with it because they can't keep up with it as it stands. Will it impact your ability to live well during retirement years? Absolutely. Is your retirement protected from inflation? And so this is what's called COLA. 
cost of living raise. Now you can see here inflation rates are since 2012, not very high. When I'm using inflation rates for doing my reporting, I always use an, a rate of about 3%. I like to overestimate expenses and underestimate income. That way we make sure that we have enough money when we get out to the end. Now, if you have a question about whether or not that inflationary rate is correct, I can actually show you exactly what inflation has been since the day you were born out to today and tell you what those averages have been over that period of time. But you'll find that if you use a 3% inflationary rate on an average, you'll do pretty well. So this is makes shows you what happened since way back in the early 1900s that what a dollar was worth then by comparison to what a dollar is worth today. So if you had one dollar today, Back then, you had $26 with a spending power on that. So that dollar is worth a, a lot less today than it was back then. But that's over a very long period of time. This is kind of a reverse curve here as far as the purchasing power of a dollar goes. Now, in addition to that, we have to worry about taxes. And taxes, by far, is my favorite subject. Um, I, I laugh all the time when, when I start teaching this stuff because so few people really understand taxes at the level that they should. And if you had some basic understanding of where tax rates have been and where tax rates are likely to go, you would probably immediately start doing things differently. So the highest income taxes have ever been since the inception of the temporary income tax and the establishment of the IRS in 1913 has been 94%. And the average over that period of time is 57.12%. Currently, we're sitting at 37%. Now, you look at this chart and you go, well, what difference does all this make? Well, first off, I can remember that when I was younger, back in the 70s, I can remember my dad telling me that he wasn't going to go to work that day because he was going to pay all that money out in taxes and it just wasn't worth working. And I thought he was completely nuts until I learned this stuff and I realized that he was correct. He would have gone to work and he would only got 25% of what he actually made. Now, if you lived here in Southern California today with a 94% top marginal tax bracket and you were in that top marginal tax bracket, you would actually be writing a check for approximately 7% to go to work. So it's between the state and the Fed, you would be writing a check to go to work. And people say, well, taxes will never go back to that. Well, I would say to you, well, what's the national debt, okay? But before we get to the national debt, let's talk about what percentage of all the income taxes paid in America are paid by the top 25% of taxpayers? And the answer to that question is 87% of all of the income taxes paid in America are paid by the top 25% of taxpayers. So what is the AGI, the adjusted gross income, joint household income for the top 25% of all taxpayers? And the answer is $87,044. Now, I don't know where you live at. I don't know where you're from. I see a few people out here. I see Lonnie Hood and Paul Lewis and Gwen Nail and David Matsu, Matsu, Matsumoto-san. Konbawa. And, and I, I see you out there. I don't know what part of the country you're from, but I can tell you if you're here in Southern California, where I live at, if your joint adjusted gross income before deductions is $87,044, that means you're living just above the poverty level. So this is the average earnings across the country for the average earners that are out there in the top 25%. Now think about this for a second. If that's the top 25% of all taxpayers and they pay 87% of the taxes, where are the balance of the voters? And the answer to that question is the other 75%. So the people that are not paying the taxes and the people that are on the dole are, are the majority of the voters. Now, once you understand that, then you gotta understand this. We have a national debt of $31.5 trillion. And down there in the right-hand corner, you see the unfunded liabilities, and that's for Social Security, Medicare, and prescription drugs. It's $181 trillion. 
Now, if you were following this stuff, you would know that that number right there has gone up by $12 trillion in the last 365 days. So currently, with $320 trillion upside, $312 trillion upside down, rather, and we have a national budget of $4.6 trillion, and we spend between $1.4 and $1.5 trillion more than we bring in every single year. Now, that should just be frightening to you. Now, if you understand where taxes have been, and you understand what the national debt is, and you understand what's going to happen in the year 2025 when tax laws sunset, so the Trump tax laws will sunset, and in 2026, most of your tax brackets will go up. Now, there's a message in there, and the message is this. Currently, right now, today, at this very moment, taxes are on sale. And if taxes are on sale, the question I always ask people is, look, if taxes are going to be higher in the future, why are you deferring taxes to the future? Why aren't you paying those taxes today? And most people say, well, I'm not paying them today because I don't want to. I'll just wait. But I think as you begin to understand how things go, you probably don't want to wait. You probably want to be looking at getting to tax free as fast as you possibly can. Now, the third risk that you're going to face in retirement is going to be the stock market risk. Now, I can tell you exactly what the stock market's going to do. It's going to go up, and it's going to go down. It's going to go up, and it's going to go down. And it's going to be doing that forever. And it's been doing this for as long as I can remember, and it's certainly going to keep doing it for as long as I'm alive. So if we go out there, and what I find most interesting is people are always cha chasing average rates of return. So I want to clear up some myths here. And now, if everything you thought to be true turned out to not be true, how soon would you want to know? So what if I told you that average rates of return were a lie? People say, well, that's impossible. They wouldn't lie to us. Well, let's find out. So here's the deal. I'm going to invest, by the way, before I do this, uh, let's pick on... Um, how about uh, Lonnie? Can Lonnie hear me? If he can, unmute himself. It's going to be kind of hard to do this. Okay, well, if, if he can hear me, great. If he can't hear me, great. I don't like it when they don't have their cameras on. But anyways, something's in the chat. Oh, okay, there's Lonnie. Okay, so Lonnie, if I could give you a 25% guaranteed average rate of return for the next four years, would you want to do business with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you'd be foolish not to. So I want you to watch this now, okay? So here I am, I've got $100,000, and in the very first year, I'm going to make 100%. And in the second year, I'm going to lose 50%. And in the third year, I'm going to make 100%. And in the fourth year, I'm going to lose 100%. Now, I imagine you, you, I'm sorry, 50% rather. Now, I imagine you're pretty good at math. So if you were to take 100, positive 100, negative 50, positive 100, negative 50, you would find that you came up with 100. If you divided that by four, you would find that your average rate of return was 25%. Now, that wasn't a very good deal, was it, Lonnie? So yeah. this is what you need to understand that if there is one negative year in the prospectus that they're showing you an average rate of return, then the numbers are a lie. So did you ever wonder, did you ever go do the math about what was my average re rate of return over that period of time? And if it was this, why didn't my money double, et cetera, et cetera? And if you start doing the math, you're going to find out that it's kind of a smoke and mirrors type thing. So it's not about average rate of return. It's about net spendable money at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, how much money do I get to put into my lifestyle instead of putting into their lifestyle going forward? So when I go out over here, the reality is, is I got zero. I got a 0% rate of return because of, there was more than one negative in that period of time. Kind of a trick question, isn't it? 
Now, I told you the market's going to go up and the market's going to go down. And what we know is that the market goes up on an average of about 3.9 years, and then it corrects itself. Now, we just came off of one of the longest bull runs ever in the market. We had about a 10, 11-year run up in the stock market, which was fantastic. Now, do you guys know how you win in Las Vegas? Well, the answer is you don't play, right? Do you know how you double your money in Las Vegas? Well, that's pretty simple. You just take and you fold it in half, okay? Now, the jokes are gone. How do you win in Las Vegas? And the answer is, when you win, you leave. So one of the things that you might want to consider with regards to how you're investing your money for the future is the money you're investing in your risk tank every once in a while pull some of your chips off the table. Put them in, over in the more predictable things that are safer, more predictable, give guaranteed returns and guaranteed outcomes. Now, we all know this picture. This was back in 2008 when the crash of the market and we probably all remember it pretty well. In addition to we remember last year. The question here is not if the market's gonna go down. The question is, how many times will the stock market drop during your retirement? Now, what do I mean by that? Remember, I told you, you're over here playing the accumulation game. So you're trying to put together as much money as you possibly can so that when you arrive in my world, which is preservation and distribution, you don't run out of money. And the market's gonna go up and down and all over the place, and it really doesn't matter. If you were in the market and you lost last year in the market, all you got to do is sit around, wait three to five years, the market's going to come right back to where it was, and it's going to go higher, all right? It's going to continue to do that. And that's fine. But when you get to this world, to preservation and distribution, the game is played differently. And here's why. When you get to retirement, you must have a paycheck. You are not retiring without a paycheck. So your paycheck is gonna come from different sources. Now your known incomes will be your social security, pension if you're lucky enough to have one, maybe you have some annuities over here, and then you might have rental incomes. Now I don't really count rental incomes as known incomes because we can't count on the fact that we will always have an income coming off of there. There's maintenances and vacancies, et cetera, but we'll count them as known incomes. Then you're gonna have a need, and your need is up here. This is about you need to live on. And you're gonna have a gap between those two. And that gap will have to be made up from your other assets. And for most of you, those, those would be your IRAs, your 401ks, your 403bs, your 457, defined minimum plan, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, gold, silver, cryptocurrency, certificates of disappointment, etc. So all of those will have to make up for that. So let's just pretend that we have a million dollars in investments. And we are out here now and we need $60,000 a year to live on. Well, if we make 6%, we got $60,000. Life is good. 6%, life is good. Just one year. Stock market loses 20%. We're at 80,000, right? No, we're not. Because we still got to take the $60,000 so we're at 740. And I got news for you. You're not coming back. You can't make enough money on this and continue to consume the money and not eventually run out of money. So when you get to this second part of the game, you need to play the game a little bit differently. So longevity, we're living longer. It is just a fact of life that we're living longer. I call it better life through chemistry. They spend a lot of time selling us drugs when we were in high school, and now they're spending a lot of time selling us drugs as we go out. Now, if you were to look at how most people approach retirement, they approach it much like this road. And if you've ever been on this road, you know exactly where it is. This is the road to Death Valley. And you're driving along on this road, and what happens when you're driving along on this road is you come to this sign, and this sign says, next gas, 100 miles. Now, the average person that doesn't know anything about this gets there and looks at that gas and looks down their gas gauge and goes, oh my God, 
I don't know if we have enough gas to get there. So they start rolling down their windows and they turn off the air conditioner and they start coasting down the hills and doing all kinds of crazy stuff to try to make it all the way there. Because they really didn't have a plan. They really didn't fill up. They don't know what their gas mileage is, whatever the case may be. And more importantly, they don't know how long they're gonna live. A 65-year-old male today, average life expense, uh, life expectancy is about 83 to 85. Female, about 85 to 87. And of that couple, one of them has a very good chance of making it well out into their 90s. So when you're doing your retirement planning, be sure to do your retirement planning all the way out to age 100. And people say, well, that's nuts. I'm never going to live that long. Well, my question for you is this. What if you do? What if you actually make it that far? Do you want to do it broke or do you want to do it still having money? Now, the question I always ask is, are you prepared for a 25-year vacation? I, I, I talk to people about retirement all day long. And I have people tell me, I'm 55, I'm retiring. I say, well, great. What are you doing for the next 35 years? Oh, I'm going to play golf. Well, if you play golf for 35 years, you're going to find out it's going to turn into a job. Now, for most of you there, just think about the answer to this question. Do you spend more day, money on weekdays or weekends? And I can tell you, I've asked a lot of people that question, and it's always weekends. Now, you want to hear something really amazing? Every single day in retirement is a weekend. So making a plan to live on less money in retirement is a very bad approach. You want to live on the lifestyle you become accustomed to, adjusted for inflation and taxes out and beyond your retirement years. So the way it used to work is like this. Our pension was the base of our retirement. We had a pension, and then we followed that up with a supplement of Social Security, and we followed that up with what we managed to save. And along came what was called the Pension Protection Act, and these 401ks and ERISA plans. And what they did is they encouraged us to stop putting money in pensions and basically gave them the right to do away with pensions. And it's all up to us to save. So now it looks like this. Very few people have pensions. Almost everybody gets Social Security. And then it's all about how much money you saved. And if you didn't do a good job of saving, then there's chances are you're not going to have enough money to make it out through your life expectancy. So the first step is figuring out where you are financially. See, in order to go somewhere, the first thing you have to know is you have to know where you are. And everybody always says, well, I have to know where I'm going. It's not true. You have to know where you are. Once you know where you are, then you can determine whether you're going. Then you can determine whether you don't have enough fuel in your tank to get you there and beyond. So this is what's called the personal economic model. And what happens in a personal economic model is, is if you look at all these tanks right here, this is pretty much how money works. Now, I don't know if you can see my mouse running on this screen over here. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Okay. So money comes down this great big tube right here. It comes over here. It hits this tax filter, and then it's consumed and gone forever. But the, what most people do is they bypass the tax filter, they put it over here through this qualified tube right here, and they put it in what we would call the yellow tank. And the yellow tank is what we call the risk tank. And the reason why is because you can see it has no lid on the top of it. So occasionally we get some evaporation, such as the downturn in the market just in the last year. And then this red stuff that's over here, that's our tax deferral. All right, So that's the money we're deferring. Now, the other way we get money in these tanks is we pump it up this pipe, and at this diverter right here, we either choose to put it in our safe tank, which does have a lid, or we put it in our risk tank over here. And then a lot of people, we show, show over here potential reserves, but that would be the equity we have in our house. Well, most people have a mortgage right here, okay? And then we have our house over here like this. 
So that being said, that's pretty much how the, the economic model works. So let's take a look at this going forward here in a second. It gets down to this. What, what do I need? How much money do I absolutely have to have in order to retire? And now maybe, maybe I've paid off my house, but I've got, say, a mortgage, and I've got my taxes, and I've got my insurance, and I've got food, and I've got utensil, utilities, and whatever, health care, etc. But then that just tells me what I need. But what do I want to do? What do I want to do in retirement? Do I want to play on the golf course? Or do I want to work on the golf course? Do I want to take vacations? Where is my discretionary cash going to come from? And so once I determine what it takes to live, not exist in retirement, then I can move out here and I can start figuring out how to implement that strategy and maximize the guaranteed income. Now, there are three sources of guaranteed income as I explained to you before. We have pensions, we have Social Security, and we have that terrible word, annuity. But the thing to understand is that a pension is an annuity. So if, when people start telling you how terrible an annuity is, when I have a class of a bunch of people, I always go around and I say, first thing I say is, look, if everything you thought to be true turned out to not be true, how soon would you want to know? And of course you'd want to know right away. So I go and I ask them, what's a CD, what's an annuity, and you would be astonished at the answers that come out, and I'm going to do that to you here in just a moment. So we have three sources of guaranteed income, pension, social security, and annuities. And the thing you need to understand about pensions is they might be there. Okay, if you look at this chart right here, these are pensions across the country, and as you can see, Illinois, Kentucky, and a couple of the states up in the Northeast are not doing so well. All right. They're underfunded, probably don't have enough money to carry all the way out going forward. Most of the other ones are in okay shape. So when we're looking at those three sources, one of them is Social Security. And I teach a separate class on Social Security, and if you want to go watch that, it's out on our YouTube page. Feel free to watch that. And probably should, because when it comes to Social Security, most people screw up on how they take it. But the thing to understand about Social Security is that Social Security is the one thing and the only thing that continues to increase by 8% every single year you wait. So you have what's called your FRA, or your full retirement age, which creates your PIA, which is your primary insurance amount. And everything is determined by that. Don't make the mistake of taking your Social Security because you think you have to. So people stop working at 62 and they say, well, I've got to take my Social Security, I need a paycheck. Well, see, they probably could have supplemented their income or created their paychecks out of those other assets that they had, their IRAs, 401ks, etc., as opposed to taking their Social Security and got a lot more benefit out of their Social Security over their lifetime had they done it correct. As a matter of fact, doing it incorrectly can cost you well over $100,000 over your lifetime. So be sure to watch that and then come to us and we'll run a Social Security report for you and show you how that works. Now, the other thing Social Security does is it keeps up with that COLA, that cost of living raise. And remember, we got to keep a little bit up with inflation. Unfortunately, Social Security doesn't do a really good job of doing that. When I'm running the numbers on Social Security, the number I use is 1.5% for inflation going forward. And I know we got 8.7% last year and 6.7% the year before that. And, you know, we might get 6.7% this year. But on an average, it's closer to 1.5 to 2, all right? As a matter of fact, many years, you don't get a raise in Social Security. Now, there is something out there besides that that can actually do kind of the same thing. But before we get there, it's important to understand that Social Security, according to Social Security, about 40% of your retirement needs will come from Social Security. We need to understand that this is generalized information. So this is generalized to the point of this is the average American. And it depends on where you live and what you live on as to whether or not that's actually true. But if you want to run with that, then where is the other 60% going to come from? 
And that's typically going to come from your other assets. Now, one of the things you can use in that area is you can use it in an annuity. So here's that question. Remember, if everything you thought to be true turned out to not be true, how soon would you want to know? So I go around and I'll ask one person in the class, I'll have 30, 40 people there, I'll ask one person to please tell me what a CD is. And they'll say, well, a CD is a certificate of deposit with a bank, banking institution, and it's a set rate for a set amount of time, and if I take it out too early, there's a penalty. That's about right. It's just one thing wrong with it. It's a certificate of disappointment. Now, I couldn't call it anything else because I think that's pretty much the answer. And people say, well, the rates are really good today. No, the rates are not really good today by comparison to other things. Money is relative. And depending upon what interest rates are on your house or whatever the case may be, the interest rates on CDs are higher. When interest rates on mortgages were 22%, the interest rates on CDs were 16%. So it's all relative as to what you do. Then I would ask the next question. What is an annuity? Now, what most people think an annuity is, is it's like a social security, like a stream of guaranteed income. I give the insurance company a set amount of money and they give me a set rate for really high fees and they're terrible and, and they believe all this stuff that they hear. But if everything you thought to be true turned out to not be true, how soon do you want to know? Because what an annuity is, is an annuity is a savings account with an insurance company. So a CD is a savings account with a bank, and an annuity is a savings account with an insurance company. Now here's a question for you. Who has more money, banks or insurance companies? And the answer to that is hands down, insurance companies have more money than banks. Who bailed out the banks and the government during the Great Depression? Insurance companies. Where do banks keep 25% of all their tier one liquid assets? Insurance companies. And whose money is that? It's yours. Because see, the bank wouldn't have any money at all if you didn't deposit it in the bank and the government didn't give them four and then they turn around and lend it out. So the only way they make money is lending out money. So that being said, what really is an annuity? Well, an annuity is a savings account with an insurance company. And there really are three types of annuities, four if you wanted to get down to what you believe an annuity is, which is a single premium immediate annuity where we give the insurance company money and it's gone, just like that. Now we have a payment for the rest of our lives, 10 years, whatever period certain it is, and our money's gone. But if we use it as a savings account, then we have three choices. We could use a variable annuity. My advice, stay away. We could use a fixed annuity that's exactly the same as a CD. It's a set rate for a set amount of time, penalties for taking it out early, but it's got a couple of features that that CD doesn't have. And one is no matter what money I put in there with the exception of a Roth, it's gonna grow tax deferred. And if I put in a Roth, it's gonna grow tax free. In addition to that, an annuity, the one thing an annuity can do is it can provide a guaranteed lifetime income that you can't outlive. Then the last annuity is what's called an index annuity, and what it does is it gets some of the gains of the market and it never participates in the losses. So last year when the market was down, you got a zero in your annuity while they were losing 20%. And there's a trade-off for that. You probably only made 5 or 6% when the market was going up. But you can actually make much higher rates than that, depending upon what your crediting methods are. But remember, the annuity can still do two things that nothing else can do. And that is, it can provide an income stream that you can't outlive. And it can provide tax deferral on non-qualified money. Non-qualified money is our taxable money, the money we put in CDs, etc. The other thing that these annuities will do if you pick the right one is the longer you wait, it'll increase by approximately 6% every single year. And in addition to that, if you get the right one, it has COLA, inflation protection against it. So it will go up over time. Now I can show you and I can prove to you that if you were to take any amount of money and you were to put it over here, in a brokerage account or any other investment and put it over here in an annuity 
and you were to take the same drawdown rate that the annuity would guarantee you and apply it against those two accounts, both of them will run out of money. The difference is, is when they run out of money, the annuity will not run out of income. So one of the things that almost everyone, regardless of your net worth, should be using inside of your portfolio when you get to retirement which is the distribution and preservation phase, is you should be using some annuities as your income stream or your paychecks. Now, this is not true for everybody, but for many, many people, regardless of your net worth, it makes sense when you see the math. Remember, people lie, mathematics doesn't. But, you know, if you listen to the mainstream media, the mainstream media says that everybody should buy a white Prius because it gets 75 miles to the gallon. And it is the only car in the world that you should buy because it is the best car. It gets the best gas mileage. And if you try to buy a BMW or a Porsche or a Mercedes Benz with leather seats, they're just screwing you. Well, you see, you don't always buy things for necessarily for the rate of return or the rate of the gas mileage. There's other reasons why you buy them. And there's other features inside of them that make them possibly better than the white Prius. And I don't know about you, but I don't want anything to do with a Prius, okay? I want a big truck or a fast car. And I don't really care what the gas mileage is. Remember what I told you. It's not about the rate of return. It's about the net result at the end of the day. How much money do I get to put into my lifetime and live out over my lifetime? And how much money do I get to pass on to my children in the most tax favored way? So the first thing they'll say to you is, well, the fees are terrible. Well, what if I told you many of these products don't even have fees? So they have no idea what they're talking about. And they have a lot of other features, such as principal protection, guaranteed lifetime streams of income, and opportunities for increases. And I'll tell you again, I can put the money over here in any investment, put it over here, take the same drawdown rate, and they're going to run out of money. The annuity will not run out of income. So... Time Magazine said securing at least a base level of lifetime income should be every retiree's priority, at least if they want to live happily ever after. What are they talking about? They're talking about getting guaranteed streams of income that keep up with cost of living raise and will be guaranteed to be there as long as you and your spouse are alive. Secure the paycheck and then take risk all your money. It doesn't matter at that point, but be sure to secure your paycheck. So now we want to minimize and eliminate tax risk in retirement. Now, I love this thing here. If you, I always describe it as, go, I'm going to write you a check. I'm going to loan you some money. But let's say you go into the bank and you're going to take out a loan. And you start to read the contract. And the contract says, look, they can call the note anytime they want. Okay, They, they can tell you when you got to pay back. And they're not going to tell you what the interest rate is when you borrow the money, but, but they'll tell you when it comes time to pay it back. Now, I'm betting there is not a single person watching this who would take that loan. But what I would ask you is, could you tell me the difference between that loan and your IRA, 401k, 403b, 457, defined benefit plan, or any other tax deferred account? And the answer is no, you couldn't. Because your partner is Uncle Sam, and Uncle Sam determines what the rules are. They determine when you're going to pay it back, and they also determine the rate at by which you're going to pay it back. See, you're not deferring taxes, despite what they tell you. You're deferring the calculation out to a point in time that if you paid attention when I was talking about taxes, your tax rate's going to be higher, despite the fact that they told you you should put your money inside of a tax deferred account because you're going to grow on money you would have otherwise paid in taxes. And in the end, you're going to have more money because you're going to be in a lower tax bracket. Did they tell you that when you get there, you're going to need the same amount of money that you need to live on, but you're going to get rid of your three largest tax write-offs? 
you're probably paying off your house as fast as possible. You've kicked the kids out of the house, not such a bad thing, and you've stopped contributing to your qualified accounts. Now suddenly that those are gone, you've lost your three largest tax deductions or they simply change the tax laws and standard deductions are so high that you don't even itemize any longer. And then you know what happens? One of you dies. And when one of you dies, you immediately jump tax brackets. So now you have to file single. And suddenly you find that you're paying out more in taxes than you ever would have paid before by simply paying the taxes up front. Understand this. There are only three ways to grow your money. Tax as you go. This is your cash savings, certificates of disappointment, bonds, etc. You get a 1099 on that every year at the end of the year. That 1099 goes into your AGI and it gets taxed at the rate you are. Now here's a funny part. You go out there, you're making three, four, five, six percent on your money, and then all of a sudden you get a 1099, and instead of going into that account and pulling the money out to pay the taxes, you reach into your pocket, out of your lifestyle money, and you pay the taxes. So you reduce your lifestyle in order to pay the taxes going forward. Now there's tax deferred money. That tax deferred money is the money they told you to put away, tax deferred, so you can grow on money you would have otherwise paid in taxes, and in the end you'll have more money because you'll be in a lower tax bracket. Well, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true, but eventually you're going to have to pay the, pay the piper. Uncle Sam's going to get his pound of flesh. Then there's the tax free money. Over tax free, we got 529s, we got Roth IRAs, and we got Index Universal Life. So these are the three ways we can grow our money. Which one's the best one? Well, they always say tax-free. That's simply not true. It is always better to grow your money tax-deferred or tax-free over tax-as-you-go, but whether it's better to grow your money tax-free over tax-deferred is determined by your exit strategy. When it comes time to take your money out, will you be taking it out at a lower rate than when you put it in? And if the answer to that is no, then you lost the game. Because you must take it out at a lower rate in order to come out ahead. If you take it out at the same rate, you will be even. If you take it at a higher rate, you lose. It's literally that simple. So grow our money in the most tax advantage way. Well, Roth IRAs are phenomenal things, okay? They're very, very good. However, they have some limitations, quite a few as a matter of fact. The amount of money we can put in a Roth IRA is limited, determined by whether we have a traditional Roth IRA or whether we have a 401k Roth IRA. If we have a 401k Roth IRA, we can put in quite a bit more. If we have a traditional Roth IRA, we can only put in up to $7,500 this year if we're over the age of 50 and $6,500 if we're under the age of 50. In a 401k, we literally can put in, a 401k Roth, we literally can put in $27,000 a year. In a traditional Roth IRA, if our AGI, our modified adjusted gross income, is over $214,000 as a married couple, we can't contribute anything to a Roth IRA unless we use a backdoor approach. This isn't a Roth class, but I'll teach you one more quick thing about that. The other way we can get to Roth IRA is we can do what's called conversions. And most of you should be doing conversions right now. You should be capitalizing on your tax brackets, paying that money, getting it over into tax free, if you know anything about what your future looks like. Now, the second way we could do that is we can use what's called a properly maximum funded life insurance policy under TEFRA, DEFRA, TAMRA, 7702, 101C, and 101A of the tax code. And most of you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Because so, here's what happens for most people. They do not own life insurance. They own what I call death insurance. And they don't call it death insurance because nobody would buy it. They buy the most insurance using the least amount of money for the purpose of dying. If I told you that you could grow your money tax-free, you could access up to 85% of it at any time tax-free. You could put it back if you want. 
you could get most of the gains of the market, never participate in the losses, and when you died, it passed on a two to three times that amount tax-free. Would you want to do that? How much money would you put in that environment? And I'm betting the answer is as much as they possibly could. Well, that law works like this. You buy the least amount of insurance using the most amount of money, and that rule is set by the IRS. Now, why is the IRS concerned about how much money I put in life insurance policy? And the answer is, they don't like competition. I get to grow my money tax-free, I get to pass it on tax-free, and I get to access it anytime I want tax-free, and put it back if I want tax-free. What's to lose? But make no mistake, everything has a bad. So you can't just go out and build one of these things overnight. It takes time to build one. The fees are very high in the beginning, but it will outperform any other investment I've ever seen over the long run. It's pretty incredible once you know how to do it. As a matter of fact, if people understood the things that they could do with life insurance, there would be a line 10 miles long outside my office and I would never stop writing applications. It's really amazing what you can do with it. And it's quite a bit better than a Roth IRA on many grounds, but that doesn't mean to not have a Roth IRA. Now, I want to clear up one thing really quickly so there's no confusion. You've heard me talk tonight about how taxes will be higher in the future. You've heard me talk about how it's very possible you shouldn't be deferring taxes. But make no mistake, if your company is matching the contributions you are putting in your qualified plan, you need to do that. You need to put the money in the qualified plan because they're paying your future taxes. And there's some new rules about whether you can put their contribution into a tax-free account. I'd be happy to teach you that stuff too. So Ed Slot, who calls himself a recovering accountant, the number one source in the country on qualified money, IRAs, 401ks, etc., said that the single biggest benefit in the tax code is the tax exemption for life insurance and most people simply don't understand it. Most people's most underutilized asset is their insurability. There are so many things that you can do with that, you would simply be amazed, especially if you're a high net worth individual. So we've gone out there, we've put all this stuff together, and then the next thing gets down to reviewing and managing on an annual basis. I can tell you that shit happens over and over and over again. Now, some of it isn't shit as so much as it is kind of nice. There's new babies, there's new grandkids, kids go to college, there's funerals, <coughs> there's long-term care. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And if you could tell me the day you were gonna die, I swear to you, I could create you a plan where your last check will bounce. But what you need to do is you need to plan that you're gonna live forever. So here's a real quick case here. Here's the Flintstones, just to give you a little bit of idea how all this works, okay? So the first thing I did is I went out here and I did a, a discovery on where they're at, okay? And I want to show you what I showed them about taking an annuity, and I explained this to you a couple times tonight. I want to show you what happens if I take an annuity and I put it in an annuity and I put it in a stock account. So I got a million two ninety three nine sixty one here and I'm going to give it a six percent guaranteed rate of return on the stock account and the annuity I'm just going to let it do its index thing over on the side. And if you look down here at the bottom I took out hundred thirty nine thousand fifty five dollars per year every single year out here. Alright and I'm going to click this button and move forward. And by the way, the withdrawal rate out of both the stocks and the annuities was $91,000. So that other money that's coming in is coming in from Social Security. So I'm going to move forward here. And by the time I get out here to age 83, I'm already going to have run out of money. So I'm not going to have any money in my stock account. I got a tiny little bit of money left in my annuities. And one more year, I will be out of that. Now I'm getting $92,000 more a year than I was getting the year before because now my annuity is still paying me. So my lifestyle's up by $139,000. And if I make it out here to age 90, 
I got $789,000, $789,691 more out of that annuity than I would have got out of the stock account. Now, I didn't go put every dime I had over in annuities. I put a portion of my portfolio over there and I left another portion over growing somewhere else. But you can see I'm getting $92,950 net income more each year than I was getting the year before once I ran out of money. Now, if I go out and I put the stock market on it here, you can see that if I put the stock market, and I, and I probably ran year 2000 to 2021, okay, you can see that my income is the same, but now I'm running out of money by age 75. So by age 75, I'm running out, and by the time I get out to 90, it was a 1.4 million, 1.5 million dollar difference inside of that. Now, I always tell clients, like, if you don't get it after this, I just can't explain it to you, all right? Why you would take a chance any other way is beyond me. And incidentally, that income comes on a joint lifetime, meaning that as long as myself or my spouse is alive, that money's going to continue to come. And prior to that, if I was back here, okay, you can see a $1.2 million. So right here at, at 68.75, I've still got $937,000 in my annuity. If I died right here, my heirs would get $937,000 in my stock account, I got nothing. So there's some real power inside of this tool, and it's something that everybody should be looking at. You should not be discounting it based on, oh, everybody should drive a white Prius at 75 miles to the gallon, because you see it isn't about the rate of return, it's about the net result at the end of the day. And if I could do that in a tax-free environment, it would be even better. So once again, the question is not how many times the stock market will drop. It's, it, it's not if it'll drop, rather. It's how many times will the stock market drop during your lifetime. And remember, all you got to do is lose some, and then you're just going to consume and consume and consume until the money's all gone. So the distribution point of your life is played very differently. Now, I love it when people come to me and the first thing they say to me, the very first thing is, how should I invest my money? Should I buy one of these news? Should I buy one of these life insurance policies? And I just look at them and I says, look, if you walked into the doctor's office for the very first time, you've never met this doctor in your entire life, and as you walk through the door, they handed you a pill, would you eat it? And I would hope the answer to that would be no. Because the problem there is there's been no diagnosis. And for me to give you any sound advice whatsoever, or anybody else to give you any sound advice, I need to take a 100,000 foot view. I need to help you figure out where you are financially, and then what is your plan, what are you doing currently to make that happen, and are you going to run out of money? What's your taxes going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. And once we do that, and once we can make that comparison to where you're at, then it's very simple to sit down and run this rule. Good, better, best, never let it rest till good gets better and better gets best. So we help people in lots of ways. We help individuals, families, businesses, retirement income planning, social security maximization, tax minimization planning, life insurance reviews, mortgage planning, estate planning, and long-term care. Little clue for you. Long-term care is going to be mandatory in most states going forward. It started in Washington State. It's about to happen in the next 365 days in California. It will be a mandatory tax. If you haven't put a policy in place yet, you should be looking at doing it now because it is coming and you're not going to like what you get force-fed. So what did we discuss today? Well, we discussed your current retirement savings structure is broken. It used to be that we had a pension, we had Social Security, and we had the money we saved. It looked like this. We flipped that on our head, and now it's all about the money we saved. So it's money we saved, pensions a very small amount, Social Security is a supplement to that. The only way for a successful retirement is through an income plan that protects you from the four key, key risks, which are longevity, stock market, income taxes, and inflation. And don't forget all those other ones that happen along the way. 
that retirement income roadmap is a five-step process. It's not a one-step process, it's a five-step process. You've got to have a plan. People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. So, what's next? Where do we go from here? Well, first thing to do is to set up a meeting. It's no cost, no obligation. Leave your damn checkbook at home. You don't get to buy anything. We'll go through there. We'll figure out where you're at. We'll determine whether your plan will get you there or not. We'll get, gather your latest retirement accounts. Get your, for sure, get your previous or as soon as possible, your newest tax return. The old one will do just fine. And then we'll do an assessment. We'll figure out whether that's going to work or not. And then we'll decide whether to set up a follow-up meeting from that point forward. Now, I hear this all the time. Well, I already have an advisor. I says, great. So tell me something. Do you have enough advice, or enough confidence, rather, in your current advisor to get a second opinion? And I don't think it matters what you answer to that question. You probably should be getting a second opinion. Understand something. I hate the word financial advisor. I cannot stand it. Most financial advisors, not all, are nothing more than glorified stockbrokers. Buy this stock, buy this bond, buy this mutual fund. This is not going to be about what you buy. I'm going to send you out to play in a pro golf tournament tomorrow. You got to make a choice. You can have the best golfer in the world's clubs, or you can have their swing. Which one do you want? My goal is going to be to teach you the swing before you go buy the clubs. And once you understand that, you're going to find that you're going to start investing in different clubs than the ones that you've been buying all this time. If you're a high net worth individual, you will be shocked at the ways that we can save you on estate taxes with small dollars using something called premium finance. If you make more than $400,000 a year, we can show you how to save as much as 75% per year on your taxes going forward. We also offer annuities, guaranteed income you can't outlive, life insurance, death insurance, long-term care, estate planning, trust and wills. This is an important one. If you haven't watched the videos on that, come learn about our new service, about how you can get your trust done for $1,995, one-time fee, never pay another legal fee the rest of your life, be able to change it anytime you want, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for a measly $29.95 a year storage fee. Premium finance, Social Security timing reports, all of this we do at no cost for you to sit down and figure that out. So, oh, I forgot to put them up on the screen. I was talking about them and they weren't up there. No wonder they put a button here, okay? <laughs> So once again, annuities, life insurance, long-term care, estate planning, trust and wills, free analysis of existing policy. If you've got a life insurance policy that you've had more than five years, we should look at it. If it's not broken, don't fix it, but often you could do better. So what now? Well, schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Literally, all you have to do is scan this code with your phone. It will take you right out to the calendar. And we'll answer those four most important questions that you have about your retirement and the ones that everybody should know. And that is, what rate of return do I have to make on my investments to retire in the lifestyle I've become accustomed to? How much will I have to, well, forget that one for a second. How long will I have to work in order to live the lifestyle I've become accustomed to in retirement? How much will I have to put away every year? And then the worst question of all, how much would I have to cut my lifestyle by to be able to retire and live out throughout my life? We'll show you your own personal economic report. We'll give you a report showing whether your retirement plan is working or not. And all you gotta do is set up the appointment. Is there any questions from the few of you that are still out there online? If not, I will say adios, good night. Remember this, live like you're going to die tomorrow and plan like you're going to live forever because you just might. If you go in the chat there, Bryce will tell you how to contact him or you can go right here on, on this and cl 
click on that if you're watching this off of the recording and set up a time to get together. We can do that in person or we can do that by Zoom. I look forward to meeting you all soon and keep smiling and make it a great day.